Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming along to the SIG testing deep dive. Um, oh, or we can do that. I am James Munley. I work at Jetstack, um, and I've been yeah working with Kubernetes for a few years now. Hi, Benjamin Alder. I work at Google. I've been working with Kubernetes for a few years now as well. Um, so yeah, as I say, this is the SIG testing deep dive. We're going to focus on um, a project called Kind today. Um, who, like, quick show of hands, who has heard of or used Kind? Cool. Few, Good. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Sweet. So, um, yeah, here's the logo. Uh, <laughs> I'm a pretty big fan of that. I think this is one of your ideas. Who's, who put this together in the end? Lubomir. Lubomir, right. Like, big, big uh, kudos to him, because that is great. Uh, so, yeah, what does Kind stand for, though? Um, so, Kubernetes in Docker, like Dyke. Dined, um, but with a K. So um, gen the idea here is to use Docker containers to simulate nodes, so almost like the machines that you're used to with a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we just use a container instead. So they're kind of similar enough. Um, we'll go into a bit more detail, obviously, today um, as to where they're not quite so similar. But yeah, that's the general idea. Um, the goal here is to make it easy to run clusters anywhere um, and just make it nice and portable. One of the big sales of Docker is obviously that you can run your same code here or there or anywhere. We're trying to do the same with Kubernetes. So uh, it supports multi-node out the box um, and high HA control plane. So you can have multiple uh, kind of nodes ru like running your workloads as well as running you know, multiple instances of etcd, API servers, control managers, and so on. One of the key things when we started building this wasn't just to be able to start a Kubernetes cluster. But it's also for us to actually be able to build um, a Kubernetes cluster from any arbitrary kind of Kubernetes commit. Um, as anyone who follows SIG testing knows, they're responsible for, uh, or we're responsible for um, testing Kubernetes. So being able to take any random code and kind of turn that into a cluster is, yeah, very valuable for the SIG. Um, it's, yeah, over the past six to nine months or so. Uh, the actual cluster boot time is now down to 30 seconds. So we can go from kind of zero to an actual working running cluster that you can run pods on in, yeah, 30 seconds. So it's great for doing things in your laptop or anywhere else. So yeah, why would you use Kind? There's a few different use cases. We are today going to focus on testing Kubernetes itself. Um, so that's kind of running the end-to-end -end and conformance suite. You could be using this, um, I personally do, for testing applications you build on, Kube, like, again, Kubernetes, so your own controllers, extensions, even things that don't necessarily extend Kubernetes. If you just want a Kubernetes environment to run them in, uh, it's really useful for that. Um, it's also now being used for bootstrapping um, clusters that are built using the cluster API. So for anyone that doesn't know, cluster API is kind of creating clusters using clusters um, and using the API server. We need a bit of Kubernetes first to do that, and Kind is perfect for that with its slow, its quick boot times. Um, so yeah, some of the requirements for testing Kubernetes. So from the start, the whole thing needs to be able to run in a container. So for anyone that doesn't know, Prow is the Kubernetes testing CI platform, um, and it all runs on Kubernetes. So every single thing that you see and that we do today has to be able to run inside of a pod as well. So yeah. We also need to run Kubernetes itself from source, as we said before. So take a, take a source tarball or just like a git commit checkout um, and turn that into a running cluster so that we can go and run the likes of conformance tests on. And of course, it should pass those conformance tests. Um, so it's not as simple as just booting the cluster. We need to actually show that the cluster behaves as it should. Um, and yeah, and that's what conformance suite for, is for. So. What we end out with there is Docker and Docker and Docker and Docker and <laughs> and you can kind of keep going. Um, yeah, I think I put a diagram together a while ago when we first were working on this. It was entitled Kin Din Dink, uh, which is Kubernetes in Docker and Docker in Kubernetes. So <laughs> yeah, it kind of keeps going all the way down. Um, so how does this kind of look? Um, so the actual Kubernetes cluster, as it were, um, all kind of gets packed up into a single Docker image. So Kind itself is a little CLI tool that you run on your computer. Um, 
What it does as part of its uh, kind create cluster command, it will actually go and pull the kind image that we've built. Um, that image contains a kubelet, so built from some commit ref. Like we go and tag some actual, like for each Kubernetes version, we'll go and build, push, and publish uh, these images pre built, containing a kubelet, kubeadam with the correct version, uh, Docker configured correctly, systemd as well, and I don't know. If anyone's tried to run systemd in a container, there are a few extra things you have to do. It's not too happy about it. Uh, same with Docker and uh, same with the kubelet. Uh, and we also package all of the core images. Now, the reason for that is we want to be able to run kind without an internet connection, without any external dependencies. In fact, on the way over here, I had to quickly copy and paste some kubectl output, and I just did a kind create cluster on the plane. 30 seconds later, you've got a cluster running. So that includes the likes of etcd, core OS, uh, core DNS, uh, the pause container, Kubernetes API server, all of these other images that have to be built. They're all packaged into one image, so you can just run that offline uh, without any external dependencies. And that's great for testing, too, because you don't want something outside the cluster to change or something outside of your test environment to change and cause your test to start failing one day uh, because someone broke Docker Hub, something like that. So this is roughly what it looked like. Um, this is a deep dive, so we're kind of following on from a uh, similar talk that we did back in Seattle. Um, so back in December 2018, you can see we've got Docker running on the host workstation. Uh, host workstation. So this is your laptop or um, on our actual CI nodes or whatever else. The kind CLI tells Docker to go and start an image, and we do a few extra things in there to actually get it going. Uh, and then within the node container, as you can see, these components that we spoke about before. So we've got systemd. Systemd then starts Docker. Um, and from there, it's kind of a typical Kubernetes architecture uh, with a kubelet, user pods, and all of these other, all of the extra bits. So we've got our CNI running in there as well. And as I said, this supports multi-node. So there might be multiple of these node containers. But for illustrative, il il illustration's sake, we're only kind of showing the one. This is what it looks like. So we've done a fair bit of work. And a few things have changed since then. Um, yeah, we've taken out Docker itself. That's been replaced with Container D. Now that was, um, yeah, that brings a whole load of speed improvements for us with it loading those images into the container. So that is one of the key things that has allowed us to reduce the uh, start time, the boot time down to 30 seconds. When that comes to locally developing, that's really significant. Um, because, well, no one likes waiting. When it comes to CI testing, these jobs run thousands of times a day. Shaving off 30 seconds from, like, from 60 seconds down to 30 actually is quite a significant difference. Um, we've also replaced uh, the CNI with a much, uh, a much lighter stripped back version called KindNetD. That gives us a cross-platform IP, well, the CNI itself gets cross-platform IPv6 support um, and a number of other things. But it's generally just a lot simpler. So I'll hand over to Ben for this. Um, our Docker and Docker and Docker changes. To now, in the same time, since then, our GKE cluster that we run this all on has switched to Containerd nodes. So now we actually have Containerd in Docker in Containerd. This is fine. <laughs> it turns out to work pretty well, but it gets a little confusing sometimes. So we've been working on a lot to make this better, as James talked about. Um, we fully preloaded the images, so at runtime, what we used to have to do is we had a bunch of Docker archives packed in the image. We'd wait for Docker to start inside the nodes, and then once Docker was ready, we would load all of those tarballs into Docker. And that's pretty slow. It's copying around a lot of data. These Kubernetes images are pretty big. Um, so with Containerd, there's a separate content store. And what we've done is, instead of having them actually unpacked, it's just in the content store with deduped image layers stored um, in a content address store. And we are able to do that at build time so that when you boot the image, they're just already there and it just unpacks them to disk and starts running. And we don't unpack them to disk ahead of time because the performance trade-off there is uh, not worth it. And it also allows you to potentially use different snapshotters, which matters depending on which file system you're running on. So this made the startup a lot faster. And uh, with these images being fully preloaded, as James mentioned, offline development works, 
Um, we also built a tool for side loading images so that what you can do instead of pushing your like your application that you've built, instead of having to like push that to a registry and then have Kubernetes pull it down, when you're running CI, since kind is already local, you can just build the image in the CI and then you can run these side loading commands to copy that image into the uh, node containers and into their runtime and then you never push anything, there's no internet, everything's local. Um, we got it certified conformance, so we didn't just you know, make sure the test passed, we actually went through the process with the CNCF to make sure that you know, we've got this certified, we're in the landscape. Um, we got some limited support for ARM64 and PPC64 LE. If anyone is interested in that, we'd love some more help with us a little bit of CI, but we haven't quite fully, like you need to build your own images right now, but it, it should work. Um, we got a documentation side up, and that was actually a lot more than you'd think. We've uh, been setting up a process so that other Kubernetes subprojects can request a site like this and you know, set up their docs and whatnot, independent of the main site. Not everything belongs on the main Kubernetes website, but we really wanted to make sure that we can you know, show you how you to do everything. Um, the lightweight minimal networking which James talked about was actually a pretty big deal. Um, it turns out most of the CNIs are pretty expensive, and maybe they make sense in your environment, but for Kind, we have everything on one machine, on a Docker bridge. We know all the APs. We have pretty good control over all of it. So we're just installing routes between the nodes for the podsiders, and we're doing a basic bridge and host local IPAM. Um, it's very light, very simple, easy to follow. Um, we've had a lot more configuration support, so you can do things like add extra mounts to your nodes so that you can pass through data. Um, and so you can set like the API server listen address and port, and just basic things like that. We've got proxy support because we found a lot of environments uh, have issues with this. And we've got a lot more going on. So as we talked about, we've been running this in Kubernetes CI. So this is Prow. Um, we're running here. What we're doing is we're running the conformance tests, but not the serial ones, so we can run them really fast. And uh, that's been great. We have like a whole grid of we run this against like every Kubernetes version under development, and we get a much faster signal than we otherwise would. Normally, this will take like an hour and a half plus. Um, with the parallel run, we can get it down to like 20 minutes or so um, with some other uh, caching improvements and whatnot. And uh, this has also let us made we're moving towards this is an optional pre submit currently, but if you've ever filed a Kubernetes PR, Tests can often take well over an hour. Uh, we've got a test here that you know doesn't run as many tests yet, but because it's so light and local and we save so much time bringing up clusters and tearing them down and managing all the resources and whatnot, we're able to get results sometimes, in, in this case, as low as about 15 minutes as opposed to well over an hour. Um, so it should be a much better experience. And the other big thing here, which we're considering doing, talking with SIG testing, is actually just having the pre-submits that do clusters use this because anyone can run this on their laptop, and there's no cloud provider specific anything. And then we take the cloud provider tests and we run them in post-submit, and we've run across a bunch of cloud providers, and everyone's on a level playing field. Whereas right now, because of how the resources are, it's just Google Cloud. Um, so now we're going to demo, hopefully, <laughs> see how this goes. Uh, I don't know how many people like booting clusters on stage. but So I've got this patch here. Uh, I wrote this this morning, trying to come up with one for a while, and I eventually just said, OK, so we're going to make everything say hello KubeCon. So this is the logging library in Kubernetes, K-log, because of course we have K-everything. And uh, so I've just added a, a little bit in the init function here to make sure that it will just keep printing hello KubeCon, say hi to everyone. So because bu building Kubernetes is still slow and boring, I've already built a kind image. So we're just going to boot that image now and skip the build part. You can it's going to take about 30 seconds. So what it's doing is it's just created the node container after making sure the image is present. We generated a kubatum config based on all the inputs, which in this case are defaults. And now we're starting the API server. Um, that's what's going to take the most time. Um, but it should be about another like 10 or 20 seconds here. Um, you can see how you can switch out different images there just with the one extra flag. Obviously, there's defaults, but you can go ahead, build your own. Just do that. So we've got a cluster up. So by default, currently, Kind generates a kube config for each cluster. It's really simple. It means you don't mess up your actual kube config. It just make sure they're separate. So we've just set kube config to point to that cluster. Now we can uh, take a look at the pods. And so we can see it's up. 
Cordiness is still bringing up, but it'll be up in a moment. So let's take a look at the logs for a Kubernetes component that's going to be using this logging library. So I'm just going to pick on Cube Proxy here. And there we go. Hello, KubeCon. <laughs> and now we can just go ahead and tear this down. As you see, we're specifying the name. Everything is keyed by a name, so you can have multiple clusters, about as many as you want, until you run out of RAM or CPU. So what's next? Uh, network management. We've got to nail that down. We found a lot of people have like weird DNS on their hosts, or like in our case, people like to run in Kubernetes clusters just like we do. And um, you'll wind up in a situation where it's trying to talk to core DNS from like the outer cluster, and it's talking to an IP it can't see. Um, so we're going to work some more on that and try to really nail down all of that, make sure it works great in every environment. Um, we're getting close to having IPv6 testing in Kubernetes CI, which will be a first, finally. And we can start working on making sure the tests actually work. Shout out to Antonio, who's actually sitting right there, who's done a lot of awesome work on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is going to be exciting. There's already work on a dual stack kept, but we don't have anything to make sure that single stack even works with IPv6. So we're going to, we're going to get there. This is going to be really useful. Um, a big problem we have with people using it to develop applications right now, which was not the initial use case, is uh, accessing their services when they're not on Linux. When you're on Linux, all of the nodes have IPs like you'd expect. You can contact them. They're on the Docker bridge. It's not a problem. But we also support Mac and Windows. And when you're using Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, you cannot contact the container IPs. So we're working on some tooling, trying some different experiments for ways that you can uh, be able to contact those things from your host and maybe install a route, something like that. Um, we also want to make building cheaper for everyone. So right now, you actually need to build Kubernetes. That's kind of unnecessary, because we're constantly building Kubernetes in CI and uploading it to GCS. Um, so what we want to do is add support for grabbing one of those builds, so you can just specify a Kubernetes version and get an image that we may not have published yet. Um, and we just want to make things faster. And we're trying to get from alpha to beta, make things stable. But we're probably going to break a few more things along the way using uh, fixing the network stuff. So please, please, please use a release version and pin your node images. By default, we pin the image name and the hash just to make sure nothing changes. Or you know, if Docker Hub gets hacked, that you're not running a privileged container with who knows what code in it. So if you want to learn more about some of that, we have a different talk, which actually Liz Frost from uh, Heptio, now VMware, submitted and unfortunately wasn't able to make it. But I pulled James in here. And we're going to talk about testing your Kubernetes apps with Kind tomorrow morning. And that will get more into that topic. Um, if you want to contact us, we've got a whole bunch of ways here. Um, and also, you can just contact either of us directly. Thanks. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time for some questions. So anyone? Hi. Can you just show us uh, how to start uh, build, if, if I want to build my current uh, Kubernetes source and then mm -hmm. start it? Maybe not the whole process, but just how to. So I believe I actually saved the output. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I actually saved the output, but I didn't think anybody would be super interested in this. So you run kind build node image. And if you want, you can specify the image name that you want it to produce. Um, uh, by default, it will just call it kindest node latest. Um, and in this case, it's using the Kubernetes is upstream make build for most of the process. So what you're seeing here is just normal Kubernetes build output. You're seeing a fun thing here that some of the build actually uses that same logging library. So we're getting that output there. Um, <laughs> and then here, we've uh, pulled down the images that are not actually built as part of Kubernetes, but you definitely need them, like the pause image, etcd, core DNS, our kindnet D image, and the IP mask agent. Um, and then what we're doing here is we're booting container D. Uh, so not too exciting. And then we've loaded each of the images into the content store. And we've shut it down and saved the image. 
And that's another fun thing that we're doing that is normally not considered to be a best practice, but tends to work great. Um, you will always see, don't use Docker and Docker. Okay, if you're worried about security, probably not. Put it on a different machine or something. But if you're running a Kubernetes cluster, you're already expecting it to control your machine, so sure. Um, and they also will tell you, don't use Docker commit. You know, use a, use a Docker file. Well, yeah, probably. But in this case, we've got some, a Go program that's being very careful about it. And what we're actually doing is we're booting the image to a sleep entry point, so it's doing nothing. And then we are execing in and taking care of things. And when we know the exec's done, we know nothing is modifying anything. And the reason they tell you not to use Docker commit besides reproducibility is just that something could be modifying the file system while it's trying to save, and then it can get corrupted. But we know that's not happening because we shut everything down, and we know that all, the only process running keeping the container open is a sleep call. And it works great. Any more? Cool. So, uh, yeah, as Ben was saying, we've got another talk uh, tomorrow morning, which is kind of focusing on more of the testing Kubernetes applications use case. Um, that's at 11.05 AM. And I actually don't know the room number, so I probably should go look that one up. Um, but yeah, do come along if you're interested in seeing any more around this. Thank you very much. <laughs>